So we have been encountering the Psalms this month, and if you're just joining us, we are in about five of six of those Psalms, and I picked six, five different Psalms for us to navigate and look through that all represented a little bit different kind of speech or prayer, if you would. And so really at the end of the day, what we've been talking about is the human experience. This is a quote I used early on. Everything that a person can possibly feel, experience, and say is brought into expression before God in the Psalms. Everything. Nothing is left out. And we mentioned this. Here's some ways that the Psalms have been categorized or at least described. Uh, The hymn book at the center of the Bible. The prayer book of Israel and Jesus. The lifeblood of Christians and the Jewish people from the earliest of times. I love these last two. A sort of gymnasium of prayers. And I love this. The anatomy or an anatomy of all parts of the soul. Everything is included in the Psalms as far as what's happening inside of us. And we have recognized this. Sometimes life is filled with satisfying seasons. In fact, some of you, you may be in a satisfying season right now of well-being and you're filled with gratitude, and you recognize the consistency of blessing. And as Garrett, I don't know where you went, Garrett, Garrett just said, maybe you're standing or sitting next to that lighthouse, and you're touching it, and there is a sense of safety or comfort. And so these seasons articulate coherence and joy and delight and goodness and the, the reliability of God, and we see it. We see his creation And so we started with Psalm 8 when we first started this series. And you and I imagined, at least attempted to imagine, the psalmist gazing up into the stars, into the sky, before this psalm was written. Uh, and, And we looked at these verses. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. And so you and I remember that God cares for us and that there's an orientation to creation in this particular psalm. And so we see that and we see that uh, our attention is drawn to the majesty of God. And, And as the psalmist is looking up into the sky, he's wondering what on earth does man even matter to you? Mankind, humankind. And so there's concern there. But you and I also recognize that life doesn't always play out that way. It doesn't always present itself as oriented. It's not always tidy and neat and clean or characterized with joy or gratefulness. It's never free from trouble or despair or distress and discomfort. And so it's not always well-ordered, right? So some of you in this space may be in a season of disorientation. Life may not be well-ordered right now because of some news that you have received. Uh, I I can imagine that Tina's world right now is a little bit stressful as she is mourning the passing of her father as well as the Zetagrins the same way. You don't expect it, and so it leaves you in disarray. And so we look at human life and we realize that life is filled with moments of disorientation, and we can't escape it. In fact, the reality is this. We recognize this. We say, this is where we are right now, and this is not how things are supposed to be. We say those kind of things in disorientation. And then we went this way. We realize that sometimes in life, difficult circumstances happen to us. In other words, you didn't do anything to bring those circumstances on. You didn't cause it. You didn't make a bad decision. You didn't do anything to provoke. In other words, your behavior, your actions didn't provoke the circumstances that you were in. And that could be a number of different things. But we also learned this, um, that they don't tone things down in the psalm. So even when they're in those seasons of life, they don't tone things down. They say what needs to be said. And so sometimes a psalmist or a writer or you and I are going to feel like we are abandoned. Like for whatever reason, God has left us out of the picture and he doesn't see us And we're lost. And so we have these personal laments. So we had Psalm 13. And this is what the psalmist says in Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have some sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Pretty painful personal lament that we looked at. 
sometimes difficult circumstances are a result of our own behavior. Actions or decisions. Sometimes we make really poor decisions. And sometimes we say things we shouldn't say. We do things that we shouldn't do and there's consequences. And those consequences sometimes have massive ripple effects. And so how do you speak to God when you have absolutely messed up? Worse than you could possibly imagine. How do you speak to God? And so we had Psalm 51. Followed a really difficult discussion of David's circumstances with Bathsheba. And so we see a psalm that is about confession and forgiveness. And so this is what David said early on. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your loyal love. Because of your great compassion, wipe away my rebellious acts. Wash away my wrongdoing. Cleanse me of my sin, for I'm aware of my rebellious acts. I'm forever conscious of my sin against you. You above all I have sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight, so you are just when you confront me. You are right when you condemn me. And so you and I, as you navigate the entire Psalm 51, you see this move from confession, I've, I've really messed up, to the anticipation of I think that God will forgive me. I know that God will forgive me. And then we ended the psalm this past week with this. God created me a clean heart. Just something to remember. Right? So anytime we've messed up, we're, we're asking and crying out to the Lord, creating us a clean heart. And so I'd like to say this because I want to remember this. The Psalms are not weak. They should never be seen as acts of unfaith or failure on our part as human beings to name the negativity. Sometimes we've been made to feel that if we mention these things, that in some way it's an act of unfaith, but they're bold. God asks us to speak boldly to him, and so we have these words, these characteristics of Psalms that Garrett mentioned, Psalms of orientation, Psalms of disorientation, and Psalms of new orientation. And our lives, as you and I know it, are characteristically, typically, either um, stationed in one of these words or seasons of life, or we're transitioning from one to the other. But the Psalms reflect what's happening in the life of the psalmist. So here's what's great. We also recognize this. We do not stay. I guess it was Garrett or maybe, maybe Blake. I don't know which one of you was saying these things. Uh, we don't stay in those places of disorientation, thank goodness. Right? Sometimes it may seem like a lifetime depending on what you're going through. But we don't stay in the chaos. We don't stay in the distress or the catastrophe of the moment. Something happens and you and I eventually, thank goodness, move from a season or moment or circumstance of distress and disorientation to new orientation right so we have psalms of new orientation and if you pay really close attention to the speech pattern in the psalms you'll see the move from being in a really bad place to being in a really good place and i love this because psalms of new orientation are filled with joyful surprise. N.T. Wright would say it this way, we're surprised by hope. Have you ever been surprised by hope? Like when you thought there was none, there's hope, right? You see a glimmer of hope, but these psalms are filled with hope. Um, they're overwhelmed with the new gifts of God, and the author writes about it. Joy breaks through despair. Where there was darkness, there's now light. And the God who we know that can make all things new provides a new awakening, if you would. And so the psalmist will reflect on these new awakenings. And so these psalms affirm this God of salvation who puts humankind as a priority. As individuals and a community, keep thinking that way, right? Puts us in a new situation. Carl, you just mentioned, you've been, you're an elder for like 17 years. And you could have filled out, I don't know how many pages of stuff when you said, we've seen a lot. You said it kind of nicely, right? We've seen a lot. And so you can make a list of the things that you go through, and you can address those things, right? Um, but it's not always bad, right? You see some good things along the way too, but as a community, we're in this together. And then you experience something you never expected before. In fact, the joy is so powerful that it's transformational. You could never have seen yourself in this place now that you're in. And here's the, here's the phrase for this one. You and I, when you and I experience, here's, a re, here's why it's called new orientation. You and I are never the same once we come into that space. 
Because you can't go through those difficult seasons into a new space without being something new. Things are not the same as they were. And you and I are not the same people that we were often. And so you and I move from pain, or at least the move from the pain, to the surprise is really unimaginable. We can't see it. And so this is where I want our kids to participate because here's the message for our children and adults today. If you're a kid, go ahead and stand up where you are. Last time I let you stay seated. If you're a kid, go ahead and stand up. Don't be embarrassed. If you're a kid, they're like, man, we could stand up in church. Go ahead and stand up if you're a kid. I mean, yeah, yeah, mm hmm. The high school students too. Go ahead, let's just do it. Come on, Chase. Yep, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Chase. Stand up. I want you to hear a lot of things from this, but I want, you, I want to hear you speak this over our church this morning based on everything we've talked about already. And here's what God does God brings joy into difficult places, okay? Kids, say it with me out loud. God brings joy to difficult places. Go. I love it. I don't want to prompt you this time. I just want you to lift your voices up. Because one of the cool things we said early on in this series is, is that your voices are powerful. Your voices speak against the voices of evil. So say this out loud, kids. Go ahead, out loud as you can. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a seat. Thank you. Thank you. Sit down. don't, Don't forget that phrase, though. So adults, did you hear that? God brings joy... To difficult spaces or places in our lives. And so the psalmist writes songs of joy. And they, they write songs of thanksgiving and deliverance. All right, let me be a little bit more transparent here. Some of you know me pretty well. Laura, you're going to get a kick out of this, I think. Uh, what you may not know about me is that I literally cannot dance. Laura's like, yeah, I know, Dad. My wife knows the same thing. I literally have no rhythm. I've told you before I'd love to have been in a band. Blake, I have never seen Blake dance, but I assume that because of his, oh, he's, oh, if you all could have seen Blake's response, he goes, oh, I can. <laughs> he's owning it, and I love it. There's the, the your, your confidence is radiating on the stage to me, man. Uh, I cannot dance, but here's the same thing. I have the same confident response. Like, it doesn't embarrass me when I tell you I can't dance, okay? I get it. Uh, Mm, I'm never going to be on Dancing of the Star with the Stars, Haley. Never. A, I'm not a star. B, I'm not going to be Dancing with the Stars, okay? Um, I could crush some toes, man. Let me tell you that right now. Sorry, Jen. Uh, y'all heard of the Food Network show, uh, Worst Cooks in America? I would be on the show, Worst Dancers of America, okay? Some of you are probably amazing dancers, and that's great. I do love to dance, though. I love to dance when Jennifer and I are out with live music, and uh, I just, I, I really enjoy it. I don't mind making a fool of myself. Give me a silent disco any day, students. If we put headphones on everybody in this room right now and turned it on, it'd be kind of surprising, wouldn't it? It'd be fun. I love to dance, but I can't dance. Whew. Sometimes, though, we're in difficult seasons of life, and we just don't feel like dancing. Anybody? just don't feel it you don't feel like dancing about 24 years ago our family was visiting my sister who lives in Panama City Florida I was 25 I'm pretty sure I think somewhere on there Chris, Laura I don't even know if you know the story or not uh, Christine was around seven and we were enjoying a day at St. Andrews State Park it was gorgeous Beautiful weather, and it was one of those days, I don't know if you've been to the beach on days like this, where the water is so clear that you can see everything. You can see everything three feet, but even as you get to even deeper waters, you can see to the bottom. And uh, after being buried in the sand and formed into a mermaid, it's one of my favorite things to do, sorry. We'll leave it there. Um, There are photographs that will bear witness to these things. So the kids will bury me and shape me into all kind of things. Christine and I ventured out into the water to rinse off all the sand. That was our job. What I didn't realize before we got into that water was just how bad the undertow was that day. There was no warning. There were no flags. There were no lifeguards. And from what I could tell, it didn't seem like anybody else out in the water was struggling at all. 
And I had no idea that the water beneath the surface was moving in a completely different and powerful direction than what it looked like on the surface. So Christine and I waded further out into the water, hoping to actually reach this sandbar where you've seen sandbars right out in the distance, where, where we were was deep, but we were hoping to make it out to the sandbar where I could see people playing in knee-deep water, and I thought it would be fun for us to go out there. But what happened is the water eventually was too deep for Christine to stand. And so I put her on my back and ignorantly began to move deeper into the water. And so essentially I'm swimming and wading with Christine, the seven-year-old, on my back. And the next thing I know, the next step I took, the shoreline dropped drastically, and I could no longer stand in the water without water being over my head. And so I'm underwater, and Christine is above the water for now. So the current begins to pull us deeper into water. Christine is still on my back, and now the water is above both of our heads. And at this point, I'm bobbing up and down the best I can to push her to the surface so that she can get air and occasionally so that I can get a breath. And I remember telling Christine, I said, baby, you have got to go back to the shore. You've got to swim back. I didn't have any more power to continue to lift her up. And so I said, you've got to go back. And I remember thinking, um, we're drowning. Like, this is it. Uh, scared me to death in that moment. And I continued to push her above my head, and I'd come back up. And what I started doing at that point is anytime I could break the water, I would just scream. Scream for anybody to help, anyone who might hear me. And what felt like a lifetime may have been five to eight minutes. I don't know how long it actually was, but it was more than enough time for the worst to happen as Jennifer is on the shore. At that point, I'm not even sure if she's aware of what's even happening. And then the next thing I know, this woman floats by on a pink floaty. The long, rectangle pink floaty, $5 at Walmart probably. Out of nowhere... And she pulls or she lifts Christine up out of the water and gets Christine onto the floaty. And I could pull myself up just enough without knocking them off to finally just relax my arms and my legs. And I'm gagging up salt water and I'm, I'm coughing. But I could breathe. And I will never forget how I felt when we got back to the shore. <laughs> and you can imagine Christine and I did not get back in the water that day. Um... I still, to this day, at 49 years old, do not enjoy going deep into the ocean because of that moment. I don't know if, I don't know if Christine has vivid memories of this moment in time. I don't even know if Christine, to this day, knows how close we were to drowning at that moment. And I have no idea how to explain it. I have no idea where this woman came from. But to this day, I don't think it was a coincidence. And we can have conversations about that if you want to. But it is the closest thing that I have experienced to a new death ex- a new, uh, of a near-death experience. I've never experienced anything like that. And I was terrified. And there was nothing I could do about it. Someone else had to intervene at that point in time because within my own power I could do nothing to change the circumstances and so Psalms 30 represents a time if you want to go ahead and turn there represents a time in someone's life when they were in such a bad place that the only way for them to get out of that and to be in a new place was for someone or for God specifically to intervene and so the psalmist writes this psalm of thanks for healing so you're going to see that in this text And so it's a classic Thanksgiving psalm, if you would. It's new orientation. Um, It follows calamity, and it follows something into something new. And so in this case, we think that whoever it was was really sick. They were very ill and were near death. And God has turned the psalmist wailing into dancing. And so you're going to see this. So this is Psalm 30. A psalm, a song used at the dedication of the temple by David. Now, there's some confusion in that space. Obviously, David would not have been around when the temple was dedicated. Uh, He may have written this psalm. It may be for another type of worship service, but either way, um, we know it's inspired by, by something David experienced. I will praise you, O Lord, for you lifted me up and did not allow my enemies to gloat over me. 
Oh, Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. Oh, Lord, you pulled me up from Sheol. You rescued me from among those descending into the grave. Sing to the Lord, you faithful followers of his. Give thanks to his holy name. For his anger lasts only a brief moment. And his good favor restores one's life. One may experience sorrow during the night, but joy arrives in the morning. In my self-confidence, I said, I will never be shaken. O oh Lord, in your good favor, you made me secure. And then you rejected me, and I was terrified. To you, O oh Lord, I cried out. I begged the Lord for mercy. What profit is there in taking my life? Am I descending into the pit? Can the dust of the grave praise you? Can it declare your loyalty? Hear, O oh Lord, and have mercy on me, O oh Lord. Deliver me. Then... You turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and covered me with joy. So now my heart will sing to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will always give thanks to you. It's awesome, isn't it? I hear you, Miss Irma. So whereas the psalmist in Psalm 51 was moving from confession to the anticipation of forgiveness, this psalmist is praying with urgency and confidence, right? I need to be delivered, and you did deliver. And so here's a phrase that I'm going to put up here. And I can't explain why or when God does move in some circumstances because we don't have all the information that God has. But here's what I do know. God has the capacity to intervene and turn any near-death condition into into a life of well-being. You hear that? That's the God that we believe in. That's the God that we follow. That's the God that we are children of. He has the capacity to intervene and turn anything that's difficult into something that's good. And I think that's really hard for any of us as humans to wrap our minds around. But this psalmist tells this story about being in trouble and coming out of trouble. And you and I hear the speaker reflecting on that but the speaker's on the other side before the resolution and so you hear this need of rescue right this repetition of rescue and gratitude so if you still have your bibles open check out verses one through three you have this initial thanksgiving and the psalm begins for really specific reasons of thanks right i'm going to exalt you the psalmist says psalmist has been given a new lease on life He's not where he was, and God has delivered him. And so now you and I hear the psalmist reciting in detail what the actual rescue looks like and how God provided that. And so statements in this language, look at the text there, look at the four action verbs that are here. You have drawn me up, Yahweh. I didn't do it on my own. Yahweh, you have healed me. Yahweh, you have lifted up my life. You have restored me to life. Look at those words. You have drawn me up. You have healed me. You've lifted me up. You've restored me. Each statement addresses the problem, right? This person was seriously ill and dominated by the imagery of death, and he feared demise, and he was terrified. And it's interesting that the, there's no identification of enemies in this text. We don't know what he meant by enemies. But what's cool is all of these prayers typically are model prayers, so you can insert whatever enemy you want to there. Whatever it looks like might be an enemy to you. It's unnamed. And so three times you have this author yelling out to Yahweh. But then you get to verses 4 through 5, and you have this wonderful component of joining in the praise. And so here the psalmist asked the community to join in. So if you think about it, what if one family in this room experienced something so powerful, so life-changing... And they came in on one Sunday morning, and uh, we were like, oh, that's cool. Good for you. Glad it's all working out. But it might be so big that that family or that person would invite the whole community and say, we got to celebrate together. And that word's going to come out more here in just a moment. Uh, Verse 4, the psalmist says, sing to the Lord, you faithful followers of his. Not just the psalmist, but the faithful followers, and give thanks to his holy name. Because here's the thing about this. Sometimes something is so big and amazing that it's not adequate for just one person to be excited about it. All right? 
uh, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where the entire community is behind it. And the only way for praise to be appropriate if it's everybody who's in on it. Because they're all, we are all connected to God's covenant. And the psalmist's voice acts as a witness. And he's saying, join in with me. It's a confessional statement. And so the psalmist, A, doesn't deny that he's been in trouble, but it's been overcome. Again, we don't know the specifics, but daybreak has happened, and it's pretty significant for the psalmist. Redemptive abandonment, verses 6 through 10. So in the middle of the psalm, you, you and I see the old orientation where the psalmist was. You kind of ha- hear a little bit about the calamity that he was experiencing, and he remembers a time when he felt secure. And I don't know what version of the Bible you have with you right now, but this is what the text literally says. It says, you made me stand mountain strong. Isn't that a cool phrase? Like, it's not, it's not language that we use. You made me stand mountain strong. I didn't think things could change, Lord, because I was strong as a rock. It's almost a little bit blasphemous. You ever been there? Like, you can't take me down. Next thing, you're down. Right? You made me stand mountain strong. Didn't think things could change. In my prosperity, I said, I'm never going to be shaken. It can't happen to me. But then you rejected me. (laughs) You hid your face and I was terrified. And the absence of God was destabilizing for this psalmist. He's in despair and he cries out for help and he begs for mercy. This is what he says. What profit is there in taking my life? This is pretty interesting. Am I descending in the grave? It's like he's bargaining with God, right? I'm dying, Lord, but, but what good is it that I die? Because can the dust of the graves praise you? Can it declare your loyalty? In other words, I can't give you the proper celebration if I'm dead. So you need me alive so that I can continue to celebrate. You need me to continue to witness, and I cannot do it from the grave. And then it's as if the psalmist, you and I have done this before, it's like the psalmist goes, oh, takes a deep sigh. And he imagines the God who can restore. And so in verses 11 through 12, we have God's answer. And it's the psalmist that acknowledges and celebrates God's actions, God's healing. And it's this phrase, students, we didn't sing it today. Blake, I don't know why we didn't sing this song. Because it would require some body motions in here, right? But you, you have turned my lament or my mourning into dancing. You've removed my sackcloth, my grave clothes, and you've covered me or reclothed me with joy. It's a song we sing quite a bit over the summer. So he says, Yahweh, you have turned. Yahweh, you removed. Yahweh, you covered me up. You took those things off, but you covered me up again and made me new. And the the transformation evokes praise. And I love this part about this because when you and I have been given new life or a new experience, silence is impossible. You can't keep quiet about it, right? Right? And so this song we just sang right before we got up here, how can I keep from singing? How can I keep from dancing? How can I keep from exploding into celebration because of what God's done? Listen to the words we just sang. There is an endless echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring and through and those storms may come. I am holding to and to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? There are times in your life as a Jesus follower and as a person of God that God has moved in such big ways in your life, it would be inappropriate for us to be silent. And so we praise because we've been delivered, because we've been lifted up, because our circumstances have changed. And so Psalm 30, here's the purpose of it. It's a model prayer for anybody who's been healed of a serious illness or, or, this is why I love the Psalms. It doesn't have to about you be about being recovering from a serious illness. Maybe you've been grieving the loss of an expectation. Maybe things are are now, now they're better than they were, but you're, you're grieving that expectation loss. You've been released from sin that's overwhelmed you for a long time. Some of you know what that feels like. And you've been released. Maybe you've been rescued from an addiction. And that addiction can be a number of different things. Maybe you've been delivered from pain. And maybe that's physical or emotional. Either way, you've been delivered from it. Maybe God has restored a broken relationship in your life. Or maybe you're in a season right now where you're hoping for that. And you know that God can intervene and act, but you're in the waiting stage. But maybe you have remembered or felt what it looks like for God to restore a broken relationship. And just a reminder, it's not just a mood change. All right? You don't just wake up feeling better about it. Your circumstances have actually changed. 
Things are different. It's something God creates. We brought that up last time. It's only something he can do. And God has turned your mourning into dancing. And so, kids, we have that phrase again. God brings joy to difficult places. And so we celebrate. I don't know why we find this so difficult. Like, we sing songs all the time that talk about shouting joy. And sometimes our faces don't look like joy. Right? Or our bodies, our bodies, for the, for our bodies sure as heck don't, right? It's like, we're excited. William, I did that for you, and you totally missed it. I got the, I got the arm in there. Woohoo! We celebrate. We throw parties. If you want to see biblical evidence of this, scriptural evidence of this, go back and look. David, right, we've, we've been over this how many times as far as the prodigal son goes? What does God do? What does the father do when the son returns? They throw a party, and there's music and dancing. And we celebrate. Sometimes God moves in such big ways that you cannot help but celebrate. So why is it still important? And in what ways can you and I live into the experience of Psalm 30? I think it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, Like Psalm 51, this psalm is intense and it's honest. And I think that only, only when human beings begin to fulfill their humanity in acts of gratitude for God, we only fulfill our humanity when we do this. Like it's a big part of who we are. It's not always horrible. Things aren't always bad. Sometimes things are really good, and for that reason, we bring our gratitude to God. And for Christian readers, this is what Garrett was talking about at the table. You and I are reminded and filled with continual praise for God's grace through Jesus Christ. That's what we're most thankful for, who has brought us from the grave and who has rescued us. And so here's something. You and I must never forget to offer thanks to Jesus who rescued us from death. Every one of us can sing and pray Psalm 30 as anybody who's had their life changed. So here's what I'd love for you to think about this week, whether it's with your family or whether it's with you as an individual, maybe with a friend or a spouse, create a gratitude list this week. Some of you have experienced this with me before. Sit down with Psalm 30 if you want to, but think about the good things. I promise you, when you start writing the good things that you're grateful for, it just keeps coming on out. And it's a really good reminder to think about what it is that we're grateful for. So turn that into a prayer. But go home with your kids. Kids, you tell your parents the things that you're grateful for. Parents, you tell your kids how grateful you are for them. And how grateful you are for what God is doing in your family right now. So I'm going to continue to ask this question that we ask every Sunday. Where are you today? Are you in a season of disorientation? Where things are difficult and challenging and Uh, It feels like you're out in the middle of the ocean, maybe alone. Maybe you are in a season of uh, 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 orientation where things are good. That's a good thing to be praised. We we, we sing about it and we pray about it. But maybe you've also been or are in a season of new orientation and you can't stop from singing, right? Any of those kind of things are prayer worthy. And so we're here to pray with you. Uh, We're here to have those conversations if you want to, but not just today, throughout the week. Maybe you're here to put on Jesus Christ in baptism for the first time ever. Uh, We can do that now as we stand and sing.